I'm going to try my best not to have a fit tonight up here. I don't know where that rumor started. Barna Research states that just one in four Americans are practicing Christians. What does that mean? What does that look like? What are the details to describe that? Well, they describe it really <clears throat> in three distinct categories. One of those is practicing Christians. These identify themselves as Christian. They agree strongly that faith is very important in their lives and have attended church within the past month. Non-practicing Christians are self-identified Christians who do not qualify as practicing. Many they don't attend church. They don't share their faith. They claim the banner of Christian, but their life does not demonstrate it. And then thirdly, non-Christians are U.S. adults who do not identify as Christians at all. And when you look at those three categories, a lot of your face is said at all. You mean this is real? Yes. In a city the size of Huntsville, it's more real than ever, probably. And tonight, we continue our, our doctrinal study and we come to probably one of the bedrocks, one of the most important things we need to look at. And I will tell you, as I was studying this, I realized, well, here's what happened. I, I had a conversation with myself. And I said, self, there's no way you can cover this in two nights, in, in one night. So I had a staff meeting with myself and realized that I would break it into two segments. I know you're shocked. But tonight we look at the doctrine of salvation, kind of really the, the beginning parts of this. And when you look at the thoughts of salvation, there, there's really four categories to describe salvation or four distinct areas. Uh, the first is, of course, salvation begins with regeneration. That is the new birth. It is a work of God's grace whereby believers become new creatures in Christ Jesus. The second thing is justification. Justification is God's gracious and full acquittal upon principles of his righteousness of all sinners who repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Justification brings the believer into a relationship of peace and favor with God. The third is sanctification. It is experienced beginning in regeneration by which the believer is set apart to God's purposes and is enabled to progress toward moral and spiritual maturity through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. So most of us in this room probably, and I said probably because Although I'm young, I have been in churches where I have seen grown adults that I have known for years walk up and say, Brother Jeff, I thought I was saved. I thought I was okay, and I'm not. The, the goal of this is not to make you doubt your salvation at all. But the goal of this is to make you reflect on that. And if along the way you realize that there's something not right, then we need to address that. And I've seen a lot of folks, they're so worried about status and who they are in the church and what will folks might think. I will tell you personally, I have more respect for someone that says, I thought and I didn't and got it right. And a lot of us are in, the, are in this sanctification. Let's go back to, let, let's, let's take a field trip for just a second. We're going to walk out this door. We're going to walk down the breezeway. We're going to go to the quad. And we're going to go back to children's Sunday school. And we're going to remember a song that we learned entitled, He's Still Working on Me. 
And that is the process of sanctification. We're, we don't get there. I understand, church, we never get there. But that doesn't stop us from trying. Sanctification is God works on us because at some point we're going to reach the final thing, and that is glorification when life is over. How many of y'all are excited to get a new body? No bursitis, arthritis, cellulitis, appendicitis, no more gallbladders, hair follicles, good eyesight. And one day glorification, we're the, the culmination of salvation, the final state that we're going to. A dear friend of mine used to say these words. If Southern Baptist had a national anthem, it would be Amazing Grace. If Southern Baptist had a life verse, it would be John 3, 16. And tonight, we're going to walk through that verse. I, it's on the screen, but you should not need words. We'll say it together. Uh, I have the words on the screen. It's the New American Standard that I use. You may have learned it in New King James, King James. But the fact is, let's just, I'm going to let you remain seated. But let's say these words together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Salvation is, is look, the key thing, the, the, the key statement. Salvation involves the redemption of the whole man and is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who by his own blood obtained eternal redemption for the believer. Salvation is the great theme of the Bible. The central focus of the gospel message is the truth that God saves sinners. This is the greatest news the world has ever heard. And it is the very bedrock of the Christian faith. Let me ask one question and I think we're fixing to, to jump into this. And I've heard this mentioned a while ago. If you had the cure for cancer, not followers, if you knew the exact formula to create the cure for cancer, would you share it or would you lock it in a vault and tell no one? Share it, right? So here's the question. Why is it that we know the answer to the world's biggest problem and we keep our mouths closed? The doctrine of salvation. Let's jump in. The first thing we see, we look at salvation, is the righteous demands of God. The righteous demands of God. Paul will state in Romans chapter 3, in verse 26, for the demonstration I say of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The Bible presents our salvation as rooted in the character of God. God is the loving Father who saves sinners. Even as he is the, is the Holy One of Israel who will judge the righteous, will judge with righteousness and perfect judgment. We look at the doctrine of salvation, explains how God can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God required a sacrifice for sin. Remember the Old Testament, it was an animal of some kind. There was a sacrifice that was required for sin. And so God requires a, sacri a sacrifice for sin, but yet he demonstrated his mercy by providing that sacrifice for sin. The only sacrifice, now, now please hear me, if, if you think back to Levitical law for a second, when you look at the book of Leviticus and you read the Levitical law and look at the Old Testament, remember that when sin was to be atoned for, there were certain animal sacrifices that were required for certain sins. And so you had to follow this strict list of what animal sacrifice or what Sacrifice must be made to atone for that sin, and it's only done on certain days. And so you had the sacrifice that must meet the demand 
to God Almighty. Fast forward. God gave a sacrifice that would suffice to meet the demand of God. And that sacrifice was Jesus. That's why Paul can say that he is our propitiation. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection framed the great events through which he purchased our salvation. Understand tonight, church, there's nothing you could do that would satisfy the demand of the Father. There's nothing you have to do to satisfy the demand of the Father. Because the sacrifice that meets the demand of the Father has already been done. And what's amazing in all of this is, church, is think back. We, we finished Genesis and think back to before Genesis 1-1, God the Father laid us like, hey, guess what? I've got a plan, and guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to send you to heaven, to earth. She's like, okay, this, this sounds good. You're going to be born of a virgin. All right. And guess what? You're going to die on a cross. Now, wait a second. What you say? This all sounded good at first. But the plan of God Almighty was that alone. And what is amazing is, is Jesus simply said, yes, Daddy. God's, the, demand, the righteous demands of God, first and foremost. But secondly, the need for salvation. Church, understand, there was a moment in all of our lives before we knew who Jesus Christ was. Now, wait a second, Brother Jeff. What do you, what do you mean here? Hang on, you, you've lost me. I hadn't lost you. You're still, you're still here with Baptist Church, by the way. You had left. There was a moment that you knew who Jesus was. But there's a moment you didn't know Jesus in your heart. And there's a difference in the two. It amazes me. There are so many Baptists that are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. Because they have a head knowledge but they don't have a heart knowledge. The need for salvation. Our, our sin explains the need for God's work of salvation. Sin separated human beings from God. And God's judgment against sin created a barrier no human effort could ever come. Understand, please hear me, God never moved. In the Garden of Eden, God never left. God established his parameters, his guidelines, his commands, and God sat down and God remained God. Adam and Eve were the one that listened to the lies of the devil, ate the fruit, sent into the world, and because of that, you and I are now eternally judged for the rest of our lives because of sin. And what amazes me is, is we had this discussion, and what, may, what amazes me is, is before Adam and Eve took a bite of the fruit, Adam and God walked together every day. They had a relationship that words could not describe. They had a relationship that words could not explain. And what happens is when sin enters our world, sin creates a barrier between us and God. And what's sad is, is so many of us are content that that relationship is broken because we will lie to ourselves to convince ourselves that everything is okay. And the fact is, when sin is in your life, everything is not okay. Satan will tell you that. He's a liar. He is the author of deception. He's the author of confusion. He wants you to be confused. He wants you to live a life of immorality. He wants you to live a life where folks don't see Jesus in you. That's what he wants. I was reading this morning in my personal time. I was reading about snakes. Interesting, right? It was next on the devotion. And Jonathan Kahn, who I've been reading the book of mysteries, talks about how snakes are cold-blooded animals. 
Now, here's a question, and I'm listening to go to Isaiah, but here's a question. Have you ever seen a snake really crawl straight? No. They slither. Isn't that what lies do? They twist, they turn, they distort, they confuse. In fact, Isaiah would say this. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Sinners cannot solve the problem of sin. As Paul described our plight, sinners are dead in our trespasses in sin. We see the need for salvation. Thirdly tonight, we see the means for salvation. If God had not accomplished our salvation through Christ, that is where the human story would have ended with sinners facing God's righteous wrath and without hope. Let that sink in for a second, church. Let me ask this way. Imagine your life if Jesus Christ doesn't die on the cross. You and I are eternally on a one-way ticket to a devil's hell. And when we stand before God the Father, we, ha- we don't have a leg to stand on. I am at, literally, I, I, I will stand before a holy God and face his wrath. And I know what the world says, okay? The world tells us that God is loving and God is forgiving and God is compassionate and God is gracious and God is merciful. Absolutely. But that does not discredit that God is a God of justice, a God of wrath, and sin will not go unpunished. And for you and I, because of that, again, imagine life without hope. Imagine life with no meaning, no purpose. And church, outside the four walls of this church are men, women, boys, and girls every day that get in their car and drive the parkway and sit in bumper-to-bumper traffic and are praying that someone doesn't hit them, but they have no hope. They have no peace. They walk into a doctor's office and the diagnosis is cancer and they don't know what to do. And yet for you and I as believers, yeah, cancer is a hard prognosis. It's a hard diagnosis to swallow. But I think about Miss Gloria Hammer. I love Miss Gloria. Miss Gloria was a lady, you'd walk her, Miss Gloria, how are you? Oh, Jeff, I'm too blessed to be stressed. She, had, she wore bright red lipstick. I mean, you could see her coming from a mile away. I went to go see Miss Gloria one day. She was cleaning out her, one of her rooms, and she had a bunch of books. Imagine, folks give preachers books. So I went to see her, and I was going through some books. I was putting them in my truck, and before I left with Miss Gloria, I said, I, said, Just one, I said, how are you doing? She said, well, Jeff, I'm not good. And I said, well, what's wrong? She said, what did the doctor Monday? doctor told me I have congestive heart failure. I saw doc, she said, that's good news. He, she said, he stopped, <laughs> pulled up the stool. He said, ma'am, I've been practicing medicine for X amount of years. I have never heard someone tell me that congestive heart failure is getting there. She said, well, Doc, I understand. If I die, I get to see Jesus sooner than you do. (laughs) And the thing was, she made every word of it. Like, she didn't stutter. She didn't stop. Them bright red lips just smiled, lipstick on her teeth. And she said, I just have to go home first. I thought, I wish I could look at things that way. Paul explained God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself. The Bible also reveals the way God accomplished our salvation through Christ. The cross stands at the very center of the Christian faith. Christ's death was an atonement for sin. He died on the cross in the place of sinners. To describe it very very simply, this church, Christ was our substitutionary, our substitutionary atonement. Christ died for you 
and for me. In his incarnation, Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. As the author of Hebrews explained, Jesus was tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. It's one of my favorite verses. We have a high priest that was tested in every way like we were, and yet did not sin. And the amazing thing is, his sinlessness is a, is a pivotal part of the gospel story. Because him being without sin means he perfectly fulfilled the law thus canceling God's judgment against us. He triumphed over sin, death, and the curse. Christ died for our sins, and in the place of sinners, his death on the cross was, the pen was penal, and that he paid the penalty for our sin. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might have the righteousness of God. The means of salvation begins with Jesus Christ. How did he do that? He suffered and died on the cross for you and I. Understand, church, the cross is not a pretty picture. Jesus Christ is outside the gates of Jerusalem, stripped naked, arms laid out wide open. His flesh was beaten to the pulp, did not look like a man, beard plucked out, crown of thorns on his head. Folks walked by, scoff, mock, made fun of him. His mom's at the foot of the cross crying. Disciples that he loved looks up. There are Roman soldiers casting lots at his feet. And all the while he looks and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And yet in a moment... As the sky began to turn dark, the earth began to quake. And in a moment, for the first time, the first time in human history, something happened to Jesus had never happened before, nor has happened again. And he quoted Psalm 22, verse 1. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you, know, do you know what he's saying there? Other than the fact that he's quoting David? See, see, here's what he's saying. You've turned your back on me. God, let's be clear, this wasn't my idea. This was your plan. This was your will. This was your design. Do you not remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Do you not remember the prayer? If there be let this cup pass, this was your idea. This was your plan. And I have become obedient. And because of my obedience, you've turned your back on me? Yes. Because the first time, the perfect, sinless Son of God became sin. Not his, ours. Because understand this, church, as the writer of Hebrews would say, according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Church, before I move on, let me, let me, let me just, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, Write this down. Thank you. There are, three, there, there are a couple things that must happen for sin to be forgiven. It's two very simple things. Really simple, not deep, but there are two things that must take place for sin to be forgiven. The first is this, something has to die. In the Old Testament, it was a lamb. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, it was a spotless lamb of God. Something has to die. And secondly, blood must be pour, spilled. I was going to say poured out. We'll use the word spilled. Something must die and blood must be spilled for sin to be forgiven. Unless Jesus Christ dies, there is no blood to atone for our sins. Period. It's not open for debate, not open for discussion, but the fact is when you look at the means of salvation, the means is Jesus Christ. And fourthly tonight, oh, i got to hurry. The mode of salvation. 
Think back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, monogeneo, the only son, nothing like him, the begotten son of God, the only son of God. And Jesus, in that moment, salvation is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Church, do you hear me? It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. I'm going to take a page from John McGough's book. The other day we were studying in Sunday school about pigs of all things. And how a pig is a beautiful picture of salvation. And you're just thinking, where in the world is this guy going with this? Imagine someone gives you a coupon for a honey baked ham, glazed package and all, bone in. It's a gift that keeps on giving. You can eat the ham now, keep the bone, make pinto beans later. It's a gift that keeps on giving. So imagine you take that coupon and you walk at the honey baked ham and say, look, so-and-so gave me this coupon. I want to pick up my ham. Okay? So right now the ham has cost you nothing, right? This means yes. Okay? So the ham, the, so the ham has cost you nothing. It now... But it did cost something. It cost the person who bought that coupon, right? They had to pay for it. They don't just hand those things out for free as well. So they bought the coupon. But church, the real hero is neither one. The real hero is the pig. Because if the pig doesn't die, you don't get ham. And if Jesus Christ doesn't die, we don't have salvation. So tonight when you go home and you go to Walmart, you can think about that Smithfield bone-in ham. You can think about salvation because your young preacher told you it's a picture of salvation. Hey, some of y'all are laughing. You'll never forget this story. There's a reason why, Don Reese, when I told you. Let's wrap this thing up. Remember the passage? It's John chapter 3. And please hear me, there's nothing wrong with John 3. I love that verse. But what often gets overlooked is what precedes the verse. Imagine it's a dark night in a city. A young rabbi, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, approaches Jesus. But understand, church, he doesn't come in the daylight. Because if his friends saw him, the public ridicule that he would face, there's not words to describe. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he asks the question, what must I do to be saved? How can I have eternal life? And what did Jesus say? You must be born again. And then he was going, no, wait a second, Jesus. Now, this is the brother Jeff paraphrase. Jesus, um, I can't enter my mom and be born again. Like, it's anatomically impossible. This cannot happen. Jesus says, that's, that's fine. You must be born of water the first time and born of blood the second time. The water is the physical birth. It's the picture of the amniotic fluid that would break when a lady goes into labor. And that's the physical birth. And then, of course, that would follow with the blood and born of the Son and born of the atonement of the blood of Jesus. And so as we look to John 3, 16, we know that, yes, what Jesus is saying is, for God so loved the world. Here's the answer. Here's how Nicodemus can be born again, not by physical, but by a spiritual that would only take place by the blood of Jesus Christ, the monogamous, the only begotten Son of God. That's how all of this happens. And that's the mode. In other words, saving faith is a trusting faith. A belief that involves a total person, not merely the intellect. I've seen a lot of people 
And I'll close with this, and I'm through. I've seen a lot of people try to rationalize salvation. They try to, they, they try to think it through. Now, please hear me. I'm one of the most analytical folks you'll ever meet in your life. Drives my wife crazy. It's okay. I'm okay with this too. And I can have been known to overthink things. You can't overthink salvation. But there are folks outside the four walls of this church that think they can overthink it. You can't overthink this. There's the point where you've got to realize that there are some things you're not going to understand. And the first thing is why a loving God would put his son down on the cross for someone as dirty, rotten, filthy as you. And don't forget, I've asked myself the same question. And how in the world could the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse all of, all of humanity once and for all? Again, you can't comprehend that because you're not God. And there's a moment, and I've said this before, there's a moment where logic and rationality has to stop and faith has to take over. To quote a dear friend of mine, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Salvation is a trusting, saving faith. It involves the whole person. It's not intellect. It's the fact of that I'm a sinner. Christ is a Savior. I don't, I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. All I know is that if I will place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he will save me. And so let me wrap it up. Let's, 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 let's tie a bow on this, okay? For some here tonight, you've been saved longer than I've been alive. It's okay. I understand that. I've heard, I've heard ladies saying, now i got socks older than you. I know. I know, it's okay. And you've been saved for a long time. And maybe tonight, you probably thought, I've heard this story before, Jeff. I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it. And that's fine. But my prayer for you was is that it would just remind you of what God did to get you where you are right now. Maybe you're here tonight. And you know someone that needs to hear this. Someone that needs to know that God loves them. Someone that needs to hear that there's a God that will forgive. Their life is falling apart. Their life is broken in pieces and everything they touch is just falling to, to, to shambles. Or maybe you're here tonight and you're like one of my good friend's wife. I was at the Parsonage. We were in Amory. And one of my deacons called me. He said, hey, he said, can you come by the house and talk to me and my wife? And I said, well, sure. So it's going to be a little while. I said, Corey, we were, Corey had gone somewhere in the vehicle. So I said, I, I don't have a truck right now. I said, I'll come by shortly. He said, well, we had revival, so I had the evangelist. He said, well, why don't you and Brother Randy just come? I said, let me talk to Brother Randy. I'll talk to him. I said, Brother Randy, I said, do you mind going to the house with me to make a house visit? You know, we'll ride together. He said, Jeff, that's fine. Didn't think anything of it. Corey calls me. She said, have you gone to the house? I said, well, not yet. Well, I'm waiting on Randy to get ready. She said, well, you know that she's questioning salvation. I said, no, I had no clue. So I walk in. I said, Randy, she's down her salvation. He said, hot dog, son, let's go. He threw his hairbrush, ran out the door. I think he broke the door in the process of the whole thing. We had to fix that later. We jump in the car. I think he stood across the hood like Bo Duke, honestly. That minivan was jumping the hills and straightening every curve there. And we walk in, and I said, what's going on? And she said, last night I could not sleep. She said, I felt like there was an elephant sitting on my chest. And I said, well, I said, I got a question. I said, why could you not come to the park? And she said, I wasn't leaving this house. She said, it had been my luck. I'd have had a wreck and died and gone to hell. I was not leaving this house. And she said, but Jeff, what am I going to do? And I said, what do you mean? She said, my husband's a newly ordained deacon. I mean, what, what's the church going to say? I said, I don't care what the church thinks. I don't care what the church says. 
Because when life is over, you don't answer to that church, answer to God Almighty. Would you rather have a bunch of Baptists mad and bust the gates of heaven wide open or them smiling and bust the gates of hell wide open? The choice is up to you, but I would go with A. And that night, she shared her testimony at the front of the service. When it was all said and done, there was four more adults that said, I was just like you. But I was too afraid to admit it. Again, I'm, I'm not here to cause you to play mind games. That's not me. I will present you the truth and the facts, and I'll let the Holy Spirit do the rest. But I will say this. If you are unsure, I pray to God above that the hounds of heaven do not let you sleep tonight. I pray that when you go to bed, you cannot find a, co a comfortable spot. If you go home, and how in the world you can be hungry after that, I don't know. But if you go home and you're hungry, I pray that what you eat doesn't taste good and gives you the biggest case of indigestion there ever was. You say, well, that's not very loving. You're right, it's not. It's a thing called tough love. Did you not listen Sunday? Questions or comments? Yes, Drew. Mm-hmm. So what is your talent, Drew? Yes. And you're also going to be equipped starting in July the 9th as we look at small groups, especially in that area of evangelism. How many of you went home and, and did your homework? Man, y'all all failed. Drew, you get an A. What's the curve? I'll give you a 90 to at least curve them up a little bit, okay? I'll, I'll get y'all all to from an F to a D, okay? Drew, Drew didn't top the curve for you. Any other questions or comments? Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, we will continue this thought next week as we look at some other parts of salvation. And uh, I will tell you, if you thought tonight was deep, just pack your lunch and bring your boots. Let's pray. Father, truly, truly salvation does not happen without your love for us and the death of your Son. What greater love than this than a man to lay down his life for his friends? What greater love than your son to die in her place. Father, I didn't deserve it. Father, even the very best I have is, was not worthy of Jesus Christ's death. But thank you tonight that as, as Isaiah wrote, that by his stripes we are healed. By his sacrifice, we can be made new. And that one day when I step from this life into glory and I stand before you and you ask me the question, why should you let me into your heaven? The only answer I have is because I belong to Jesus. That's all I've got. That's all I've got. And thankfully, your son will step and say, it's okay, Dad, he belongs to me. Father, protect us tonight, keep us safe as we leave this place. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, 
Amen. Y'all have a good night. See you Sunday.